You are in control of the BWI Daily Edition today. Well, technically, I'm still pushing all the buttons. I'm your host, Thomas Rankard, Nate Bauer, senior editor with me. But it's the mailbag show, so your questions, you're, you're the director. We're going where you want to go. So, Nate, are you ready to go on a journey with me? Uh, uh, cautiously, yes, I'm ready. <laughs> well, good. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show about normally we start off with some sort of what's the topic of the day? Is there something we want to discuss? Is there something you've written? Uh, yeah. But the good news is I think the the mailbag and our, our astute listeners and viewers, they got a lot of this stuff in. It's yeah. a good mailbag. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, like we here we are in the beginning of May, and I think your brain and my brain are it's that's it. There is nothing left, <laughs> right? We, <laughs> what somebody uh, I saw one of uh, my gym friends uh, at, at the at the local gym. He's like, you must have so much stuff after the draft and after spring football. And I'm like, yes, it's a precious group of gems, and I have to one at a time all summer long. Give them out so that we have something to talk about. Because if you, know, you just throw them out like you're going to make it rain, oh, ooh, it's a long it, summer. It always goes faster than you'd think. It really does. The, with the, recruit, the recruiting heats up, and then before yeah. you know it, it's – and, I mean, honestly, the way that the calendar has moved, uh, you know, like Big Ten Media Days is going to be July 20 or something. Right. I mean, there, there was a time when that was like the first week in August or the very, very end of July. Um, you know, it just seems it just seems like that cycle has sped itself up to where uh, our our dread is not matched by the reality anymore. There's there's tons of stuff. I mean, yeah. it just always is. So, yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah. And this is the, the perfect thing is we get to talk about stuff. And sometimes it may not be directly tied to Penn State football, but we can make it tied to Penn State football because we are creative, intelligent indiv individuals, but not today as creative or intelligent as our mailbag uh, subscribers, viewers, listeners. You know, because this is a podcast uh, and as a YouTube show, it's, it's always hard for me to exactly know how to say that one. Yeah, I would, I would call them contributors. Yes. You know, uh, patrons, right? <laughs> like uh, br uh, brought to you by viewers like you. Right? <laughs> I, messed, uh, I messed that up for sure, but something like that. Uh, and it very much is. We'll come back here for just one second because I always want to say, uh, Nate, we, we if you want to get on the show and you want to get your question uh, answered, bluewhiteillustrated.com, sign up for just $1, get 12 months of access, and you can ask a question when I throw up the BWI mailbag thread on Wednesday nights or Thursday morning if I fell asleep watching uh, Backyard Builds or something like that. So, you know, Wednesday night. Uh, we got a lot of great stuff last night, so we got it all in plenty of time today. Uh, so I want to make sure BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, sign up for just $1, get 12 months of access, or at Thomas Frank Carr on Twitter, but as always, our, uh, our Blue White Illustrated Premium Message forum members always get priority. Yours always get answered. So let's uh, get to it. I'm not going to try and uh, and say this particular screen name, but what would be your under-the-radar recruit for the incoming class that may surprise you and see early playing time? Uh, he, is, he or she, I should say, is bullish on K.J. Winston. Well, you took mine, so that would that was the one I was going to say of under the radar. Nate, do you have a favorite in Penn State recruiting? I mean, you know where I'm going to go with this, right? Yeah, well, it has to be Sander, or excuse me, uh, Pachetta. Yeah, Pachetta. <laughs> like, it, it, always, always go with the punter. Um, no, I, I don't. I mean, in terms of under the radar, I think that that. I mean, certainly Winston is a good pick. Um, I think Paquetta is a good pick. Uh, I don't know. What do you have? Uh, one of those, surprisingly, dis despite how deep it is, one of those safeties. Because yeah. what I wrote about yesterday when we we were power ranking the Penn State position groups with, with Dave yesterday. And um, based on kind of my film evaluation, what I saw from the blue-white game, there's no backup to Jonathan Sutherland that's a scholarship player right now. Jamari Budden is the backup over behind uh, 
the will position and Curtis Jacobs. You know, just from what I saw in the game, how they had that played out. Now, Charlie Catcher was injured or wasn't playing, was not in the game. So that's one player that we don't we don't know exactly how that works out. Did Budden switch, switch over because of the injury? Or was it that Catcher is the backup there? But it's not like Charlie Catcher has been super healthy his whole career. So there's always the opportunity uh, to get some reps there. And behind Jonathan Sutherland, if a safety is big enough and physical enough, I think you can get some reps at that striker position. So that's why I think that is where I'd go in this situation. Could could we throw... Um, I, I always pronounce these guys' names incorrectly. Vega Ioni, the, the offensive lineman. Is he... I, I know that you liked him when he first... Um, when he first committed to Penn State, is do you think he could work here? Just given the situation, first of all, there's I have many many things to say right now, and I'm and I'm messing this up by trying to spit them all out at the same time. Sure. One, we know right, like with the with the transfer portal deadline having passed, we have a pretty good idea of what Penn State's team is going to look like yep. uh, at this point for yep. next season. Um, you know, and so and so with with a guy like him though, I mean, just given the the circumstances with the numbers. On the offensive line, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think that anybody would project him to, to start. Obviously, but working into the two deep, I could see that. So that's James Franklin. The, the, we're starting with the fact that James Franklin said physically he can come in and, and compete and contribute if he if he can essentially, um, mm-hmm. which is really strong for James Franklin to say that about an offensive lineman. That almost never yep. happens. And Landon Tangwall is one of the best I've seen. And he didn't play until he had to at the end of the season. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm somewhere in that twilight zone of is it is it that or is it that? Is it that or right. is it that? And when he right. said that they didn't have Hunter Norzad committed, I don't think. So I, yeah, I believe that's the correct timeline. Yeah. Um, Ken, Ken Talley? Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I, I like to look at when considering a question like that, I like to yeah. look at positions more than I do players, right? Yeah. Like, yep. y- yeah, y- you have the hype train and all of the things that are involved through the recruiting process where, yeah, some some guy, you know, like Nick Singleton's not surprising anybody. He's yeah. not under the radar. Katron yeah. Allen isn't under the radar, um, you know, but, but there are oftentimes some positions where that that happens that works right yeah. and and safety is certainly one of them uh guys who they like to get out there early when they show the capability of doing so um but i think defensive end is another place where you know just one given what the current roster looks like right two uh you know it's a place where where there's often an opportunity for a young guy to get in there and uh you know and play at least a little bit more to come on that particular position. And uh, uh-huh. you've already hit on a couple of things that the uh, listeners are asking. But I think K.J. Winston is a good one. You you bring up a lot of good uh, options as well. My concern with Ken Talley, though, physically he's what you want uh, as far as length, speed, movement skills. But I just he's never played defensive ends. So with yeah. the number of options there, I, I would put a pin in that one. Uh, Vega Yuane is going to be about does he rotate in? I don't know right. that he's going to start, but he can no. get playing time if he's good enough. Because you look at you look at that 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 guard position. Sorry, there, <laughs> my my brain was buffering. The guard position, Tangwall, um, JB Nelson is kind of to me fallen out of the competition there for playing time. But you have Sal Wormley coming back from an injury should be I think ready to go by training camp where he's full go. And healthy and can contribute as opposed to some of the other guys we talked about. And then you got Norzad and Yuwani. So you got four right now. Do all four see playing time or do three? And it's right. that who's the third guy? That's to me the situation. And if they don't have to play the freshman in Vega Yuwani, I, I think that they would uh, choose that path. So that's kind of how I'm looking at that particular situation. Let's move on to Poncho 570. Speaking of defense, Ven, what does Damian Robinson need to work on the most this summer and fall to be the guy opposite of Disa Isaac, uh, the fastest for this upcoming season? So, Nate, I'm, why don't you take this one? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that was, that's rude. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, well, partly because I don't really want to answer the question. Um, it's hard to 
compare what we saw at Maryland to what he's going to do at Penn State. That's the problem is I don't give a crap how he looked when he was dropping in coverage other than he'll do some spot dropping for Penn State. And I think he's going to be pretty good at that. But I don't want him doing that. I want him going after the quarterback. So to me, what he needs to work on uh, is his play at the top of his rush. His ability to bend through and play through contact. Because I think he's got the hands and the quickness and the size to do it. Honestly, even at 244, whatever he is right now, he plays big. Because he's got big frame and long arms. And I, I think he's going to be closer to 250. So it's just making sure that what I see on film is sometimes he gets stuck at the top. So just... Whether it's his hand usage, his lean, make sure he gets that low profile, dips underneath stuff. That's kind of what I'm looking at. And then, like, the violence to disengage. That's really, to me, to get to the quarterback, and that's going to be what he has to do. That's what I think he needs in this situation. So, um, the, he needs to work on everything, though. Right? So yeah. He's got to know the defense. That's the other thing. There's there's a follow-up to that question, which is, where is he at currently? How far away is he from having those elements to his game a uh, good I, I would say good and and you should be encouraged that it's possible um and, and actually i'm trying to get his uh one of his i believe it's his private d-line coach on the show he uh, same guy works with deny dennis sutton uh so hopefully we can get we can get some expert answer on this and get some uh see if i'm right about that for what i've seen on film what they're working on um but that would be i would say he can do it I would say that is something that he that he can absolutely work on and and have that a part of his arsenal. And then it becomes all the other stuff. Like I said, does he know the defense? Is he going to be in the right spot? Is he going to know how to stunt in the right, you know, gap and is he going to play with aggression and not think and all those things? Because you know, we talked about Ken Talley, Denai Dennis Sutton, Damian Robinson, like there are now options at defensive end. So yeah. so there, there is going to be some competition there, which is what Penn State wants. He's obviously going to have the inside track to that, but he won't be on campus until the fall. So that is part of the barrier for him to be on the football field. Yeah, I, think, I mean, certainly all indications are that Penn State is really counting on him being able, you know, like, yeah, there's it would be a bonus if he was able to excel, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But being someone who can contribute and is reliable is is kind of at a minimum given what the situation is there. Yeah. You're always you're always hedging your bets, right? You're always saying you don't you never want to say something ironclad. Even with even with deny, I don't want to say he's absolutely going to be X because there's always the possibility that either unforeseen circumstances or things that you see in his profile that you think he can overcome are things yeah. that hold him back. So even with deny, I think he can be a little bit stiff. I think he, he can be a little bit hard to change directions at times, but he's so good at everything and he is not so bad at that, that it becomes a, a crippling thing. But does it prevent him from being a six sack guy? His first season, right. maybe, yep. maybe. And, and with yep. Damian Robinson, I am encouraged pretty pretty well encouraged that he's going to be a factor next season and not just because he has to be. I think he, you can't be a top 75 player in the nation in your class and not have the physical tools to do it. Then it becomes like, you know, the mental aspect of it, the grind of it, the injury, all of those things. So you, I don't ever want to give guarantees, but they've got a lot of good lottery tickets. I mean, they've got a lot of quality lottery tickets now uh, that somebody can hit in this Correct. first season. Correct. Uh, so let's move on to Losi's mustache. Uh, and we're going to take this in two places because I had a lot of questions about the draft and a lot of questions about Will Levis, and this one folded them all in. So Losi's mustache asks, so I know it's extremely early. Uh, last year this time, Rasheed Walker was the way too early mock draft favorite, but I've seen numerous ones. And I believe Dave and Greg wrote about this too, showing Will Levis as a top 10 pick. I don't think that will happen, but if Sean Clifford struggles again this year and Levis has a great season, how bad do you think Penn State fans will lose their <laughs> damn minds? <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize that's where it was ending. Um Yeah. How how much I mean, how much will they lose their minds? Uh, significantly. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I when Will Levis left Penn State, I, I'm not even gonna talk. I'm gonna let you be the guy who says whether or not 
Will Levis can be a top 10 pick. I, I don't see it. Maybe. Uh, but the guy that left Penn State was n- absolutely not a top 10 pick. <laughs> right? Like the, the the version of Will Levis that left, that decided to, to leave Penn State. I'm not saying he couldn't become that if he had stayed. I'm not saying that that all of the best decisions were made throughout. Um, but, but, you know, he was a quarterback with some, some pretty glaring shortcomings. I, I, I thought, um, you know, and I thought that presented itself, you know, in, in the time that he did play during that 2020 season. I, I just, that year was such a mess. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was just kind of hard to gauge what was what, but that was one thing that I thought was not particularly difficult to gauge was that yes, Sean Clifford had an unbelievable, a mountain of issues (laughs) during the 2020 season. Like nobody would debate that, but uh, you know, Will Levis wasn't so far ahead that he could take a job, which was prime to be taken. Yeah. Right. Like it was, it was there on a silver platter for someone to 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 come in and, and kind of take over and you know i didn't see it um so so i'm gonna try and do this on the fly here of kind of so clearly i know will levis's profile i saw a couple of the highlights this year i did not watch his film so relying almost entirely on pff data and pff grades to give you kind of paint a picture of the pros and cons of Will Levis. So going back to 2020, one of the things I remember the most about him as a passer was how long it took him to throw the football. Um, And uh, it's still under three seconds, so it's not an egregiously long time, and he did not have a lot of opportunities. But like when he's trying to find the deep ball, he's trying to find he was scrambling a lot. And that is something he did improve this past year is his his time to throw was better. But when it comes to, let me pull this up here quickly, his deep passing, which I think is what a lot of people are uh, kind of leaning on because he was a great runner for Kentucky. He had great production there. Big arm, all the toolsy things. We're all looking for the Josh Allen equivalent, right? We're all looking for the guy that can do everything, 6'3", 232. So he's got that build, right? Yep. Strong arm. Uh, six interceptions and six touchdowns on deep throws. So putting the ball into harm's way about 10% of the time on his deep passes was generating a good amount of, uh, you know, exceptional throws, and not all those interceptions are on him, according to PFF. But uh, the majority of his throws were shortened behind the line of scrimmage. Like, he was not doing a lot over the middle of the field. We're talking 56% of his throws were either under 10 yards or behind the line of scrimmage. Yep. So a lot of production through a lot of gimmick and then big play-action shots. And he took those and made those. And when you do that, that's when people get interested. So that's kind of, I think, when you look at the tools, you look at the development curve, he was better than Sean Clifford last year. There's just no way around it. He was better, even with the shortcomings we talk about when it comes to the decision-making and all those things. It's not like Sean Clifford was great at decision-making last year. So I, the system there is a lot of the conversation as well because he fits Kentucky perfectly. And I think yep. that is something you can't discredit because I, I don't think he fit Penn State perfectly. I think they would have he would have struggled, especially in Mike Yersich's offense, to run this system. Is that <laughs> and I mean you obviously you have a much better uh you know pulse of what's happening in the NFL, but just given the trend this year of where quarterbacks fell early, which is to say they didn't. You know what I mean? Like, is somebody going to take a right? Like, even if, even if, let's say, Will Levis has a fabulous, unbelievable season, it, is he is he that high that that someone's going to take a pick that early um, on, on that style of a quarterback? Um, they have in the past. I mean, I, I just I don't know what to expect when it comes to the NFL and quarterbacks because. So the other thing is next year, there's quarterbacks, right? So Bryce Young, uh, C.J. Stroud are going to be available in the draft. So is Sean Clifford, you know. So there's a the strong contingent of quarterbacks in this yeah. class. <laughs> Sorry. 
that was that was uncalled for. That was mean. I so Boo. Yeah, I I, I regret that. Anyway, um so it's uh, teams are going to be clamoring for those top guys. And if you don't get those top guys, the NFL wants tools at the quarterback position. I I'm actually shocked that this particular draft there weren't any guys that went in the first round that you would normally expect. But if you really look at it, none of the none of the toolsy quarterbacks presented themselves. Sam Howell, I wouldn't say, is it incredibly toolsy. He's right around six feet. He runs the ball tough for North Carolina in their read option offense where they basically deconstructed what they did the year before and put him into a kind of a run-first quarterback situation. Uh, the Liberty quarterback, Malik Willis, more tools than everybody else, but still not 6'5". Not right. all of it. Uh, so I think that Will Levis presents more moldable clay. You have production on film. So then it becomes, can you refine the issues? And I don't know what the issues are, truthfully. I have not watched his processing to know where he is mentally at the position as where he was before. But just knowing the Kentucky offense and knowing what I see here from the data, I'm imagining a lot of their production came from the threat of him running, bubble screens, basically the run game, everything in the short area, and he wasn't yep. doing those second-level throws that are going to make him a great quarterback. The other thing is, the, the Bills are trying to not run Josh Allen. Like, they're trying to build in pieces of their offense to get rid of that so he doesn't get injured, but their, their big backs and their power sets aren't working, so they just keep running their moose quarterback. Like, teams, other than... Other than the uh, the Ravens, who have it baked into their offense, most teams don't actually want their quarterback to run the ball unless it's so painfully open you can take it. That, that I think, is a fair way to put that. Uh, but I also wanted to mold this into here, into the way too early. Who are the guys you see in the way too early? We talked about this a little bit, I think, last week, maybe. Yep. Uh, I know you and I have talked about this before off-air, um, but who are the guys in the way too early mock draft that you're seeing from Penn State? Yeah, so there's there's one today uh, from, I think, Todd McShay that has Joey Porter Jr. in the first round, which is, you know, I think that you and I talked about it last week um, where we didn't necessarily see anybody, right, from Penn State get, getting that high. I, th I think that... You, I you think could Joey Porter Jr. is a, is a first round talent. Yeah. That's that's how I'd put it. And he's almost yeah. there production wise. Yeah. No, I, th I mean, uh, what I was going to say is just I, I, I think that there are probably a handful of guys that could go second, third, fourth round type type picks. Right. Yeah. Um, but but I didn't necessarily see that from him. Um, you know, but yeah, you got you got to wonder where Tig Brown is in the conversation. Right. Is he? Yeah. And and I don't have a feel for that. I mean, I, you would probably be able to lend better insight there. I don't. So he's an interesting player because what is he 511 to something like he's a he's a squatty strong yeah. body yeah. but he's a free safety so you know i need to know a little bit more and this is this is the point about the first round is Jahan dotson going in the first round is a bit and going 16th overall is a bit of an upset considering he doesn't have measurables he has the the speed and the agility and, and you know the movement skills. But he doesn't have the size and the strength. And typically, guys don't go in the first round unless they have all of it, and then some production to warrant that position. You can't have as many flaws. Uh, Tig Brown has the uh, ability to be physical in the run game, but I don't know how the NFL sees him just yet. The production yep. in in coverage, his anticipation, his ability to get to the football, obviously that is desirable. Uh, that that's 1A, what you want, but then is he a box safety? Is he a too high safety? Is he a, I don't know if he's a pure center fielder. That does not seem to be what he is. So where does he fit? And then how is that valued by the NFL outside of his skills and then his speed and all those things? So there's a lot yet to be determined, but if he puts together another season where he gets six interceptions, he might just go in the first round because picks, baby. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't do, have a good answer about do, that. I mean, they do have him listed at six foot. For what it's worth, uh, six foot two oh three. I think he's a little shorter than six feet. I, you know, just in in the realm of uh, heights and weights on rosters, just looking at him. Yeah. But what's the difference between five eleven, which is what I think he might be, and six feet? What's the real yeah. difference there? Listen, man, you, you know, you know as well as I do that I love, love, love to make fun of people that 
see five pounds added on in their their weight like but i don't know that that's a different <laughs> a different topic for a different day anyway um no there's some there's some other guys though right i mean who who i think would work their way in there you yeah. and i i think are pretty far off on adisa isaac right yes that is where the yeah. biggest gulf is is i don't i just don't see him right now as a as a second round day one day two pick because he's not big enough the nfl is going to see him as a linebacker at 240 and until he until he has the size and plays at that size i don't feel confident in that assessment now mitchell tinsley I can see a, a big bodied possession receiver with good speed. Like if he runs a four five and he yeah. shows explosive metrics again, outside of Western Kentucky at Penn state, I, I think he could be a first round pick. Cause he's got two years of production. He's got the size uh, and he just needs to show that he can do it at the big 10 level. And there could be Parker Washington. Like if he has a, if he has a big year and he's a multi-threat guy, the problem is I don't think he's going to be Rondale Moore, which is what I think he needs to be to be a first round pick. Because right. he's he's a little on the on the small side, and he doesn't have the speed of Dotson. Yeah, last guy was was PJ Mustafer as a as a very 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 late, which I think surprised some people that we had that conversation. But yeah, you know, you just it's hard to tell what to what to really expect, right? I mean, what yeah. what is the high end of where he's going to be? Now, obviously, by the time that the draft process happens. If he's not at a hundred percent, he should be close to it, right? I mean, you're yeah. You're, yeah. you're looking at fifteen months, right? Post injury, he'll have time to be in combine shape for sure. You would think, yeah. And and then you know, I mean, all of the things that he brings to the table. I mean, certainly, um, you know, th there's such a value to a guy like PJ Mustafer, but where does where does that fit in the hey, like actual? rubber meets the road. Yeah. Like elite athlete. You know what I mean? Like that, that stage of things, I'm not exactly sure uh, where that is for so, him, but I think it would be hard for him to, to be there, right? Like to be quite at that level that he was pre-injury. Yeah. So let me give you kind of a sense of where I see his draft prospects a year out. So he played in five games, full five full games. Um, and again, we're going to use just as a quick reference point, PFF run defense grade as a kind of guidepost in the conversation. 57-61 were his first two grades against the run. That is not an elite player. Now, he then followed that up 84-73-79 uh, against Auburn, Villanova, and Indiana. So I guess my point is watching him on film at 325 pounds, he wasn't an immovable object. He was rather movable at times now and that's when he we had the conversation after practice one day he said you know Dion Barnes and John Scott Jr they sat down they had a long talk about what he wasn't doing and he fixed it and he became a better player on the run against double teams which is really what it was was Wisconsin was moving him off the ball with some zone stuff and he was getting washed out of the play he did a much better job after that of getting in those positions but he was not a force in terms of physical dominance at any point in his career, really, against the run. He was good, but if we're talking about elite production to go high as a nose tackle, and that's the key part here is we, we talk about positional value, a nose tackle is not going to be highly prioritized in the draft. He right. his, his pass rushing, he has three career sacks. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that's going to get you noticed if you're the everything guy, if you're a nose tackle. Very few of them go in the first round. That doesn't mean he's not going to be a starter at the next level. So don't get me wrong. But the priority, positional value, the game of drafting, it's not going to prioritize P.J. Mustafer. And if he doesn't have any of these things on tape his, his uh, final season, I right. think it's going to push him down the draft boards. He's going to be a steal. He's going to play for a team. And he's probably going to be good. But yeah. I don't see the draft working out after this knee injury for him unless I'm wrong. And I hope I am because he's a great dude. And he deserves that. Like, he has worked yeah. for that, and it was taken from him by that play in Iowa. So, hope I, I really hope I'm wrong, but that's just me reading the situation. Yeah, I mean, but at the, at the, at the very minimum, I think it puts a, a seal, right? Like, a likely ceiling on what to possibly expect. Because I, yes. do, I do think, just given his reputation, certainly 
uh, you, you, you know, within Penn State circles, and and especially given the fact that like this is a broad career, right? He he has been producing for Penn State for a long time now. He's been a reliable piece, uh, you know, on the interior of that defensive line for so long that it it just it, it's almost a given that you you expect him to 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 have some success there uh, in the NFL, and like you just said. He probably will have some success in the yep. NFL, but he's also not a third round pick. He's yep. also not a second round pick like he, that. That would be off the table. He might have worked. This is the thing that I think is very frustrating is he might have worked himself into that position of being like a fourth round pick somewhere in the middle of the draft if he had stayed healthy. Because, again, one of the things I was tracking is he had uh, 20 stops the last two seasons in a row. He had 16 in four games. Yep. So he was on pace to be shattering all of those things. But the injury and your nose tack, like that's what I'm saying is like, I, I think he should, he would have deserved to be in the conversation of one of the best defensive tackles in this draft in a thin group, but he would have been one of those guys. And I just don't, I don't know if the NFL is going to, if they're going to see that next year when they want value, they want these things to go through. I think they want these guys to go through the cracks. So they get him as a six round pick and he's a steal. Yep. Uh, Navy Blue asks, what are your thoughts on reinstating the one-year sit-out non-graduate student transfer rule? I think it could dampen the NIL tampering to enhance entice transfers. If they had to sit out a year before playing, you can call the Jordan Addison rule. Is this wishful thinking, Nate? Uh, you know, just the genie being out of the bottle, I would have a hard time seeing college football players you know, being willing to accept that, um, you know, and that, and that opens the door more toward, you know, like I, I hate to get into this stuff cause it's just like, it just goes down a path that you can't ever pull away from, but like unions, yep. right. That, that is, I, I was just reading yesterday, uh, Eric Prisbol had from on three had, uh, an interview with a guy who used to be a congressman, but is now part of a NCAA advisory, whatever, right? Not a, not affiliated with the NCAA, but offers uh, some guidance to uh, and like consulting basically to, yeah. to NCAA programs and athletic directors. And, you know, he was he was just saying that the NCAA has created this mess in its fear of unions, right? right? Like it, that, yeah. that, that over anything else is what created this problem. Okay. Yep. What, what you currently have. And so when, if the question is just about, Hey, can you institute this rule? Well, yeah, maybe you can, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a possibility to, to try to do that if you're the NCAA, but the reality is the NCAA is already dead. It, it's, it's, it's over. Yeah. The NCAA is already, it, it's, it's already dead. Uh, you know, well, Gene what Smith, was that was their one job, right? Was to enforce amateurism and kind of give a loose structure to how all this stuff works. But that was kind of like, yeah, but it's they, gone. they got, they got, they got, again, it's hard because they gave no, they didn't give an inch right Th mm -hmm. through all those years, all those decades. They, they just refused, refused, you refuse, you refuse because they didn't want to make themselves susceptible to again, unions. They didn't want to make themselves susceptible to Pandora's box. Yep. Well, well, the, the bottom line is that the NCAA got kneecapped by legislators yep. who, who opened the door, who said, Hey, legally you cannot prevent these guys, right? Like the Supreme court is yep. what kneecapped them. Yeah. Um, and, and so now there's this standard where the NCAA lost its teeth because the Supreme court took those teeth away and they're not going to put themselves back into a position where uh, like the NCAA isn't going to put themselves back into a position where that leaves them open to constant litigation. Yep. Um, you know, so now I, I, you know, there needs to be a structure. There needs to be, there needs to be rules yeah. that can be, followed by participating institutions yeah it's just a matter of that's not going to come from the ncaa anymore yeah it, it has to be mandated it has to come down 
from a legal side of things. I, yep. I don't care who it is, whether it's whether it's Congress, right, getting something to a president, having yep. it signed, becomes a federal law, or if it's the Supreme Court making a decision in the other direction, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, that, that's just, that's the only path forward at this point to, to, to reel in the present structure. Yeah. Which by the way, if, if you, if you like the present structure, you're root for Amazon, you know, like that, that's, that's where we are. Like you're going to have these situations because that's, that's the model right now is just free enterprise for, you know, in a lot of ways. And yeah. it's just what's your what's your favorite corporation because that's the size and the scope of where this can grow to yeah, it's a I billion just, dollar business it look the the there's certainly money being thrown around all of that stuff like the concept of student athletes being on a football team and making money and and like all of that side of things is in some ways overdue it mm -hmm. th they have been part of a system that th it it wasn't an equitable arrangement in terms of money made versus yep money money coming in right yep fine okay all, yep. all, all that's that's okay like and and we can debate the finer points of that forever however <laughs> however what doesn't work is for the game right like it it doesn't work for the game of college football yeah if, if you, even if you want to call it professionalism uh major league baseball which doesn't have a salary cap it does has... but it doesn't have an official one but yeah they even they have instituted a secret soft cap but and and there are taxes if you go over and yep. there are like right like all of these different things that's out the window. <laughs> that, yep. that 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 does that does not exist right now. And so, you know, like maybe the NCAA or whatever future form this takes of a conglomerate of different institutions, right, com com coming together for football purposes. Gene Smith yesterday said to ESPN that uh, y you know you could have ten, right? So the Group of Five and the Power Five all under the umbrella of the college football playoff and acting independently of the NCAA. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what happens. Maybe, right? Like maybe that's what takes place, yeah. but you still have to have, you still have to have something in place that says only the programs with the deepest pockets and the most resources, like can pull in as many of the most elite yep. prospects as they possibly want. Yep. Right. Because because they can spend forever. Otherwise, it's just I'm, nobody's going to have fun. And and yep. there's an argument to be made that nobody's having fun anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there are four teams. There yep. are five teams in college football that matter now. It might be two by the time this is said and done. Yep. I'll shut up now. Well, that's fun. <laughs> it's over. Uh, Zl Zlati asks. Can you update on uh, some basketball transfer targets? Which incoming hockey transfer has the biggest impact? So well, I'll, you can ask the you can answer the first part. Uh, I can. I'll get yeah. Dave on this for the second part on the message board. Yeah. Uh, hang on. Uh, okay. So so Kansas State kid, they're waiting, right? Penn Penn State is waiting to see what's going to happen with him. Um, they, they like him, obviously. I think that, um, you know, some of the other options have gone away. I said this the other day, right? Uh, Davy and Bradford, like some of the other options that Penn State has been pursuing or had pursued are off the table. Ryan Young from Ev uh, Evanston, uh, Northwestern, right? He went to Duke. So, so that's off the table. That's not an option anymore. Uh, the Lehigh kid went to Richmond, I want to say, right? So like there, there have been some, some players that, that Penn state needs to fulfill that big man role that have been pursued and have gone elsewhere. And so now you've got a situation with, uh, again, uh, Bradford, the kid from Kansas state who Penn state likes very much has a relationship with, and it's very much a, a matter of him making a decision. So, 
This yeah, all sounds that, like The Bachelor. Is, well, it's you like, could it's you like, could turn this part of the off season into a TV show with roses and all that. I wouldn't watch it, but uh, somebody would. Somebody would love yeah, it. That, that's that's me taking five minutes to say nothing's happening because <laughs> it, like the the kid the kid has the opportunity to to wait and see right yeah. and and I you know I think that that's part of the transfer portal culture at this point is it's it's nice to be liked it's yep. nice to be wanted and so if you've got people calling you and and you've got other people pursuing you. You, you just, you want to, obviously you want to make the best decision for yourself, for your family, for the people around you, um, you, you know, and that in a lot of cases means, yeah, you might, you might like option A, but if you don't know what option B, C and D are, it, it's hard to make that choice. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, you know, certainly you would think that from Penn State side of things, if something doesn't happen relatively soon maybe there's a moving on point you know but right i, I think for the time being they're kind of in a holding pattern of just waiting to see what he's going to do and we'll get uh i'll get dave on the horn for you as lottie for the second half of your question uh i'm going to use your discerning veteran experience to answer this next question gim 14 asks who's your favorite new member and why is it me so, uh, give 14, a uh, new member at blue white illustrated.com. So welcome. Had a lot of those recently, Nate, a lot of those new members. Yeah, people, people checking us out yeah. and it's great. I mean, hopefully we can establish and have, you know, really the best community of Penn state fans and people who are interested. Right. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I brag thoughtfully? Yeah. Of can course. I brag and give the specific numbers for the month? Or you, you think that that may be going too far? That's yeah, that's where I need your discernment. Yeah, you, you, look, we're, we're, we're all here to, to try to do our best and provide the best content that we can. And I think, and hopefully, you know, we're doing that. And for people who are just seeing us for the first time, hopefully this is, this achieves that, right? And, and fulfills that, uh, that uh you're so curiosity. humble you're not a salesman you're so humble. i'm not okay no, I'm terrible but, so here's but the listen, deal. it's only a dollar if you here's... haven't signed up yet it's only a dollar sign up that's but uh, for, yeah a dollar but do you want to be a part of it here's the deal nothing draws a crowd like a crowd and we got a party going on at bluewhiteillustrated.com you sign up for a dollar 12 months of access that's not going away now's the perfect time if you've been looking to get it in more in if you're all in and you're like eh, i like penn state sports eh, maybe i want to go check something out. it's a dollar get in find out what you need you, you didn't know and trust me i worked for a long time covering penn state football and then when i got to on three and blue eye illustrated i was like oh wow i didn't know half the stuff that i needed to know when it comes to recruiting and Ryan and Greg and what they do, the inside information that Nate and Dave get, whether it's from, you know, the administrative side or if it's the big picture stuff or if it's basketball or if it's hockey, you get all that inside information at bluewhiteillustrated.com and it's a dollar for 12 months. Perfect time to do it right now. And Gim, you, you are our favorite for asking the question and allowing yeah. me this stump speech. We, we know some things. It's good. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, Saikim asks, Abdul Carter will play what linebacker spot and start or participate a bit by week question mark during next season? Uh, what incoming freshman wide receiver will see the field first? So asking a double question there, and he says, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Nate, we had this conversation a couple weeks ago when it comes to players that are going to be in that second wave of participation from this freshman class, according to James Franklin. So yep. by week, you know, is what we kind of came up with before when it comes to some yeah. of these guys playing. I think we said week six, right? Because the, yeah. uh, the buy is between the first week and the third week in October. So I, th I think that's how that plays out, which, you know, look like. You don't necessarily have to take James Franklin literally, but yeah. I think in that case you, sh you should, right? Is, is they're literally saying this is the timeline where you could start to see these types of players who will need to get their feet wet for right? Because they're yeah. coming in in June 
obviously you go through camp. They, they don't have the advantage of having spring practices and winter workouts under their belts. So yep. yeah, like once they're settled, once they're in, uh, you know, doing well, which they expect from a class that's rated this highly and has this many potential, right, contributing prospects yep. that they will be able to to contribute. It's just a matter of, yeah, you got you to gotta get to that point. Yep. But Abdul Carter, Abdul Carter, I think fits, right? I mean, James Franklin talked about him when talking about Mike linebackers. So, yep. He could play either. He could be a Will. He could be a Mike because he can blitz. He played defensive end at one point in his career. That is a huge part of his profile. Uh, But you, (laughs) Manny Diaz blitzes everybody. So, I don't think it matters which position necessarily. That's just going to be a strength of his at Mike linebacker. So, that would be where he fits. And then, you know, I think he participates. I don't think he starts next season. I, I would not go as far to say he's going to start. But speaking to him and watching his film from last season really opened my eyes. Like, he was not the guy he was his junior season. He turned into a different football player. And that guy can contribute next fall. So, I would wait a little bit on the Mike linebacker position because of all the parts of it. So, yeah, week six, week seven, somewhere in there, I'd say. And then for the freshman receivers, they play Ohio week two. Yep. So that would be where I would say they get on the field unless they blow the doors off of Purdue. And then in that situation, are they? did they travel? Like, were they in the game yep. plan? Uh, so yep. I'm going to say Ohio week two is where you might see Caden Saunders. Uh, all yeah. the other guys, Tyler Johnson's not on campus yet. I'm putting the brakes on Amari Evans is a guy who is learning the receiver position right now. He does not need to see the field for any reason in his red shirt season, unless they just want to get his feet wet in a blowout. So I'd say Caden Saunders is the first guy, but I, I also don't know that he's going to be a contributor until late in the season next year because of the depth and talent they have at that position. Yeah. I just, I, I think that you're looking at five, which is more than the usual, right? But yeah. five guys that they feel good about. And so when when there's that amount of depth, yeah, if if somebody flashes and is that good that you, you just have to put them on the field, then okay, that's a bonus situation for you. Um, but I, I think it's going to be challenging for anybody to kind of come in, especially of the, the late arrivers, so to speak. Yeah, yep. Right. <laughs> They, it, it used to be normal. Now it's late because <laughs> yep. there's so many early enrollees. Uh, like it's it's gonna be it's gonna be. I mean, how how are you going to displace guys who have been in and know this system for as many years as right? They've had the opportunity, certainly under Mike Yursich now in a second spring. All of these guys, um, you know. So I think I think that well, obviously Tinsley is different, but given his maturity and experience just in the game, I, I think it's pretty obvious that he picked things up the, uh, to a satisfactory level for them to feel very, very confident about what he's going to do this season. You bring up Mitchell Tinsley, a transfer, a perfect segue. Our first Twitter question, Blue Hornet 22 asks, as of today, and subject to, subject to change, how many scholarships does Penn State have for this class and what positions should they use if open slots uh, for the portal? So... Where are they? Do they have portal ability? How would they get portability? Portal ability if they need it. Uh, I do. You have this answer. I don't have this answer. I. I mean, certainly the fact that the fact that nobody went in. Yeah. Right. Uh, outside of name is escaping me. Cole Brevard. There it is. Outside of him, um, I, I mean, I think they're I think they're right around it. Uh, I think, I think they're... Dave Dave wrote over at the site the other day, and you should check it out just to make sure. Fact check us here, and we're doing this live on the fly. Check out bluewhiteillustrated.com. They were at eighty five, so they are yeah. right where they need to be. But some of the conversations are: can they find some room if they need a linebacker in the portal? So they have another linebacker. That's a question. Are they going to get another tackle? Are they because right now the tackle is a little bit iffy. Yeah. So do they it, still have the ability to grab one of those guys and make room if they need to? Yeah, it's it's just it's just a matter of whoever whoever they're replacing it isn't going to be somebody who somebody will have to be giving up football or somebody yeah. will have to be not playing for a year. Yep. Uh for 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 that to take place. Now 
you know, you know, and I know that happens all the time. Yep. <laughs> right. Like players get kicked off the team. So, something happens. Um, but I'm, you know, uh, as of today, I'm not a soothsayer and am not aware of any of those situations, nor yeah. am I aware of any of those situations potentially happening in the, in the future. So, uh, so yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it sounds like they're pretty much, uh, booked up at this point. That'll be a, uh, I don't know if that's a thing we're going to be monitoring. I know that. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's revisit that. Let's let's yeah. come back to that in in June, July. So PSU eighty seven asks, just watch the two thousand nineteen Michigan game on BTN. Kane had good runs to close out the final series, but Hamler was the go to guy to ice the game. Who can be that guy for Penn State this year? Their closer, their uh, assassin that they need to win games. Who on offense do you think has that ability to close out games? What do you think I'm going to say? Please. I, it ha I mean, it has to be Nick Singleton, right? I, I mean, I don't know. Like, it. First of all, Noah Kane was a freshman that yep. year. So yep. I think that, that is a, a good indicator. Um, You know, KJ Hamler was not a freshman, but he was young. He was I think still he was a red freshman beep, beep, beep. maybe Richard sophomore because he left sophomore. after he left after 2019 so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh but in any case no I, I guy with burst guy who can create a big mm -hmm. play for you guy who's reliable all, all of those things I mean look I, is there potential for Kevon Lee to transform himself to take enough steps to become that guy, sure. I think that yeah. that's possible. I, I, I really do. And I, and I mean, I'll still hold that. I think that he will probably be the first guy to get a carry uh, d right during the yep. season. I think he'll be the yep. first running back. But yep. I just think that what Nick Singleton presents is it, it's going to push, right? It's going to push everyone in that yep. room. Uh, Katron Allen is in the same boat. I mean, Katron Allen could, ju could do it just as easily. Yep. Um, you know, and then after that, yeah, I mean, Parker Washington, they want to get, a, they're going to want to get him. The, I, I don't know. He's my I guy. Just, so I, I'm just going to okay. say he he's going to be my guy. If if you're giving me the situation, I'll, I'll paint this picture. Nick Singleton's the guy that makes it so you don't have a Michigan 2019, so yep. that it's it's 37 to 24. He's the guy that's going to get you an 80 yard touchdown in the third quarter, so that it's not the final drive and you're icing the game. That's kind yep. of the story of 2019 is by the end of the year, they had Journey Brown as their explosive back. But here's another one that didn't happen. Minnesota. And Jahan Dotson gets caught from behind, and he talked about that kind of haunting him for most of his time at Penn State. To me, that's the closer, is you can get the receiver involved and he can make more differential plays in tight situations than a running back can because of positional value. So Parker Washington can do both. He can be the guy on a bubble screen to get you a first down to close a game. The The play that PSU 87 is referencing was a jet sweep or some sort of read option jet sweep. And Hamler also almost lost his head on the play. So <laughs> let's also remember that particular part of that play is if he didn't get that play, I don't know that they were going to have him for the next one. Um, yeah. So I would go with Parker Washington because he is versatile, and if he's healthy and he's good to go, to me, he's a guy that shows possession, some deep speed. I think he can be a, a bit of everything they need in those situations. I, I will I'll throw one more out there, which is any combination of Brenton Strange, Theo Johnson, or Tyler Warren. Yep. Right? Like that's, that's who you need. Maybe it's Tyler Warren. Uh, you know, uh, just a, guy, a reliability who can pick up the first down when you need it. I think yeah. that that position is one that they're going to, they're going to count on being able to provide that this year. But here's the thing is we've just rattled off five names and we didn't even mention yeah, right. Tinsley, who also right. has the so big who's body. The guy? Who's the Nick guy? Nick Singleton. But, Nick but, Singleton. But the good thing is there are options this year. There are options for Penn state this year. So that's a good thing. Uh, let's move on and go to Joey, Joey, J Schmidt, one thirty nine. Do you see another two kicker system, dude? This is right up your alley. Another two kicker huh. system or one guy like twenty twenty one. I I see I see multiple kickers. I see potentially 
really three kickers, actually. Um, I think that Gabe Nwosu might handle kickoffs. I think that either Barney Amore or Baquetta will handle place kicking. Um, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Way off. <laughs> uh, Barney Amore or Baquetta will handle punting. Yeah. Uh, and then, right, Jake Pinnegar or Sanders Sidek will handle uh, place kicking. So, you, but, but, you, but you're saying one kicker. I, I think Joey here means on field goals where Jordan Stout handled stuff over 50 and Jake Pinnegar handled things under 50. Do you see a split there with Pinnegar again, or do you see it's either or this year? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it depends on what Sahidek does. In ter- look, I mean, they allow data to be the primary driver there. So if Sahidek has the range, which I, I, I mean, I, I don't really think is in question that the range is is probably more than than what Pinnegar presents. But he just needs to be as consistent as Pinnegar from whatever that is, right? Yeah. 45 and in, 43 and in, what, whatever that number is that they decide. Um, if it's if it's a golf, it's a if it's a big differential, then I, yeah, sure, maybe they maybe they go back to it. But you know, I, I think that you you want both. You want one person to be able to fulfill both, but you just yeah. don't you don't you don't want to put like there, there's the no option. downside. Correct. Yeah. There's no downside to it if Jake Pinnegar is that much better from 40 and in and Zydek is that much better from 40 and out. Yeah. But if you if you have one guy who's just the guy and is just the best, then then that's who you go with. Yeah. So, I think we'll that's see. a that's a great way to put that. Uh let's see. Two more questions here, and we are in the presence of royalty because Nittany Queen is here. Heather Ashley. Bunch is a way too early top 25s have come out recently. Half Penn State is in the top 25. Half, they're not. So, Nate Bauer. Yeah. Top 25 team in 2022. Penn State, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't really have that many doubts about it, to be honest with you. Uh, now, you know, are, are they on the 20 side of things or are they on the single digit side of things? Yeah. Uh, I think single digit is would take a remarkable special turn of events, right? You need you need things to break your way. Yeah, uh, that did not happen really at all last season, and so maybe the pendulum swings, and and it's a little bit more likely yeah. uh, this season. You know, I, what are we doing? I'm talking karma here, um, <laughs> but, but it is it's karma or probability where they had a lot of close losses. And those sometimes swing the other way. You're not always going to play Michigan State in a blizzard where you can't throw the ball against the worst pass defense in football. Like, and it's the only thing that you're capable of doing, <laughs> right. right? Like, like that is just terrible luck. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, and, and and by the way, Purdue and Auburn to begin the season is very different than Wisconsin and Auburn to begin the season because Auburn has taken a step back, at least as far as what we've seen nationally, the story yep. around them with Brian Harson almost getting fired. Then just kidding. Not really. We'll keep it for another year. And like, that's never a good situation. You're never going to perform yep. your best when there's a gun to your figurative head when it comes to your job. So you could come out four and oh, I, I, you could easily come out four and oh, you can come out three and one out of that first uh, four games of the season. And then you're in the conversation because you are Penn state you're probably somewhere in the teens. You'll probably start a little lower than normal because last year was bad. It's it's just, it's just one of those things. And I know that we've talked about this before. And like, do do I think that Penn State has the capability of being an elite team in college football next season? No, I, I don't think that this is an elite team. But I think they have the opportunity to be as good or better than most of the teams on the schedule, right? Like if you're looking at the team at the teams on the schedule, Penn State has the opportunity to be as good as 10 of them at least, right? And so if that's if that's what you're facing, if those are the opportunities at hand, it's just a matter of capitalizing and winning as many of them as you possibly can. So you're saying um, they're exactly in the same position they were in 2019. That sounds 100%. like the exact same team. A hundred percent. And the, and they won those games. Yep. And then at Minnesota, which was a team that they were 
I think probably better than some things didn't go their way. Right. Yeah. And, and a game that was very winnable became unwinnable, right. They lost it. Yeah. Um, you know, but like that, if, if that's, if that's a one loss Penn state team that gets, that doesn't get to the, to the big 10 championship, but does somehow get into the playoff or does somehow get into one of the premier new year's six bowls, right? Like then maybe yeah. it's a different outcome than 11 and two with, uh, Memphis, right yep. in the bowl. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I uh, the pecking order after the top five in college football at this point, like it, there, there is no denying at this point that the drop off is severe. That's where right? the fun begins. That's where the actual competition in the sport exactly. begins. Because yeah. you can, you can play your way up to six. Yep. <laughs> right. Like just, just by, <laughs> without even being. That great, but yeah. you can play your way into that spot. You, yeah. you can you can win those amount of games, but the converse is is equally true. Is you might find yourself seven and six, or or you know anywhere in that purgatory range of between seven and nine wins, where you're kind of happy but mostly miserable. Yeah. And if you're not in the college football playoff, to quote Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first, you're last. So who even cares? Which is kind of the feeling from a lot I of care. fans. I do too. I, I, I do too. Like, what is there in no other world do we have the standards that we do in college football? Mini rant here. College football coaches, there is no excuse, and this is their fault for always saying, like, there's no excuse, I'm a leader, do the leadership thing of saying it's all on me. Well, then some people go, okay, great, well, then it's always your fault. And and there's no mitigating circumstance, there's no event that could happen that you would say, you know what, you know, I, you know last year, there was a bunch of crap going on, I understand. that. No, there's, I've been told, explicitly by fans there is no excuse that a coach could have because there's always another football player and apparently being a football player imbues you with magical capabilities that only coaches if you've got the right code can unlock like th there's no there's no world where a football player isn't just okay they all can be great and they all can give you the maximum effort and they all can be elite if only the coach can do something and that's just ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. So, yeah, same thing. You just apply it, a force factor of 11, to the win-loss record of if you're not in the college football playoff, then who even cares? And that is Frank. just kind of ridiculous. Yeah, well, look, and I, I've been pounding this drum for a long time, but I, I feel like pounding it once more for a couple of seconds, which is very simply that the representation in college football to get into the playoffs is 2% of the participants in the sport. Okay. If you look across any other major sport, hockey, basketball, right at any level, yep. the, the percentage typically is somewhere like on the low end in the twenties. Yeah. And most of them NFL, uh, right. Like, yep. Uh, you name it. NBA, it's 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 more towards the 40s. Yep. So it's just it's just this gulf of unreasonableness because when when only two percent are making it to the playoff, that means that the playoff can't be the standard of hey, you know, we, we had a good to great year because it's yep. not you, like you, you can only get to the playoff <laughs> if you are the absolute best. Yeah. And and it's just it's just it's not a fair gauge of who is good. Yeah. Not great, not exceptional, but but good. Like better yeah. than right? And so if you finish if you finish 12th in the country and you're a college football fan, most of the time they're going to be disappointed. And that's it's it's the system that is leading us to this point. I well said. Speaking of the system and how to try and game the system, you get to play Schedule Maker for upcoming non-conference games. Penn State and Syracuse for 27-28, I want to say, was just announced this week. Yep. Who's after Syracuse and where's the game being played? Ooh, I love the twist of this question. Mm. I'm all for the non-conference or the non 
the non-denominational event game because yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I understand the money side of it, but I, 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 I get it. Like maximize profit. Make, but yeah, go, go make, make an event, make an event yeah. out of it. I love that. I think you can make an event with the one-off against yep. anybody that you want. Make make it Southern Cal, make it Oklahoma. I don't care. Whatever. No, 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 if no, no, no. Got to be a winnable one. Got to be a winnable one. You can. No. You always schedule down. Always schedule down. It's not. But that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying though. Is yeah. if, if you're if you're going to do that, fine. If you're not going to schedule that game. The non-conference schedule. I just, I want. I'm gonna soak up the hate. I can feel it coming through the <laughs> the, the lens already. You should schedule Villanova, Ball State, and Delaware. Yeah, that should be your non-conference schedule because you've already you're already participating in a in a league that has put you behind the eight ball against your national competitors because you're playing nine conference games instead of eight. Yeah. Um. And so and so. But, but, but if you want to draw the fans and if you want to keep excitement high, I think that the one-off marquee game that is maybe winnable, but you might lose one, there's no downside to losing it, right? Yeah. Clemson didn't drop off the map because they lost a seven point game uh, to, to Georgia. Uh, but two, it also excuses probably in the minds of most fans scheduling Delaware and Villanova for your other two games. Yep. Right. So, yep. So maybe that would be the strategy that I would advocate for, but, um, you know. I guess my, my meantime, thought process is. on the situation is that um, probably flawed because I'm thinking of every single time if Alabama plays at some, at you know, the Falcon Stadium or Jerry World or they play in some location, they're always playing a team that technically is good. But no, is no threat to Alabama. So like a Louisville or Florida State after they had cratered as an organization. And yeah, but that's uh, Miami was that's probably Alabama. Of, ex, that's my point. Is I'm I'm looking at this from the template, but the template is just not applicable. It is ab so like if when Penn State was playing Pitt for the first uh, you know in, in that three game series, if Penn State had been in a better situation, I think overall, if you do a one off game against Pitt. What was the year they won like 63 to nothing to 10 or something like that? Like that's a good non-conference game that you could play somewhere and that would be a a draw. Or yeah. You know, Auburn actually would be a great one in this situation. Sure. I know they're a bit stiffer of an opponent and Penn State is not as good in this situation, but pick like be a vulture here. Don't set yourself in a situation where you're playing Georgia Play a name that people like, but you know you're going to beat. Like Oklahoma State. I feel like that would be a very safe one to play. Oof, don't play Oklahoma. Man, I don't know. To play, like, I, who's another one then? You know, like a name that people like. Maybe TCU of a couple years ago, like right before sure. the Gary Patterson train went off the train tracks. And you, get, you get the glow of TCU, but you don't have to play TCU. UCLA, maybe? Yeah. yeah. There's a little name recognition. Texas. But who knows what Texas? I would have played be. USC uh, up until the last year or two, maybe. Uh, yeah, more oh, like until I mean five forward. months ago. <laughs> exactly. Yes, USC would have been perfect. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> somehow we didn't have a opening topic, and we still went longer today than we have ever on the BWI Daily Edition. So I'm thanks. Done. I'm done. <laughs> I finished. I finished my iced coffee. Let's go. That there you go. That's the end of the show. BWI Daily Edition. I already gave you all the things. Subscribe. Do what you need to do. Like the video. Appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow to wrap up the week.